So this presentation is about so some stuff we learned when we built this uh, kind of data heavy uh, application um, <coughs> and especially two lessons uh, that I want to try to explain to you um, that come from like fancy computer science -y terms that if you studied computer science you would know them and um, instead of applying them to like small algorithms and data structures we apply them to like a whole system at a time so uh, that's why this is kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, what do we do? So, game analytics, uh, as it says on the tin, it's a kind of business intelligence uh, service for games. Um, there's an SDK that you put inside of your game. So, if you have a mobile game on iOS or Android, let's say, uh, you can, whenever a user does something that you're inter interested in measuring, you can send us an event. Uh, we collect and analyze these events, and then there's a nice user interface where you can look at nice reports and understand your game. And then you can use that information to improve your game. That's like the whole idea. So similar to Google Analytics for e-commerce and so on, for example. So this is what our system looks like. Um, data flows you know, from top to, to bottom. So uh, SDK goes into our collector services, um, which we have a bunch of. It all goes into a log. Um, and we have done different few consumers of the log. Um, there's the real streaming real-time analytics. There's stuff like funnels, which we do like a special case computation for funnels, and there's also um, more, lots more. Um, and then these different systems um, are queried directly by the user, so there's a HTTP API that customers and browsers use directly. So, so that this is kind of the context that we work within. Um, um, so, some bragging numbers, just to show that the system actually works. Uh, so, we have around 3 billion events a day now, um, up from um, around 30 million when we went live a year ago, so it's grown 100-fold. 100, 100 um, and daily, that's 750 gigabytes of JSON uncompressed data. So, this is what our system turns through in, in one day. <coughs> uh, so, on to like, what we learned. So there's also, we made a lot of mistakes. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to talk about all of them. So I'm going to share like what we did right. Um, and uh, one big concept that turns out to be really valuable is to use uh, a log. Um, and a log conceptually is the same as the, um, if you think of like a file system log, just like an application log on the file system. Let's say syslog or rsyslog writes to a, always appends to a file, for example. That's exactly the same concept but you want to apply it on a bigger scale. Um, so does this thing have like the, oh. So a log is like messages or lines or chunks or whatever you want to call them. Um, and you always write by appending to the end and you read somewhere in the middle of the log. Uh, or you know, if you have a real-time system, you want to read at the tail of the log. If you want to, um, go back in time and recreate some state, let's say, uh, you would tell your consumer to not have the latest offset, but an earlier offset. Uh, so if you ever use Kafka, Kafka is exactly this thing. Um, um, and the nice thing is, well, there's a few nice things. Is a few nice things. So one big upside, if you have a data intensive application, is that you can then split up the writer and the reader in the system. So uh, in our case, we have uh, around 50 million devices every day that produce data. So they talk to our uh, data collector services. Um, and then they, that's these guys that actually write. And then <coughs> we have a few different systems that um, do the actual processing. And what is nice about this is that um, the writing can be always available and we can actually turn off the analytics processing. So whenever we have like a bug, uh, or we need to make some changes um, to our setup of, of anything, or we have a new release or something, we can just disable the system, um, change the code and whatever, and then start up, up, up back up again, and nobody actually ever lost any data or uh, is upset in any way. Um, also, um, you can make this thing kind of smart. 
uh, simple and smart at the same time. So what we do is we write all of the data directly into S3. So we have big chunks of data in S3. Um, and we kind of emulate a bit what Kafka does with partitions and topics and so on. Uh, so we have some ordering guarantees and we have pretty good parallelism on the consumer side. Uh, you can ask me more about that later if you if you're dying to know how it works. Uh, so, uh, lesson number two uh, is uh, around idempotency. So, um, idempotency is that you can do the same operation twice and it's not going to have any adverse side effects. Um, and so we apply this to our whole analytics pipeline. Um, there are some parts where we have yet to make it work, but on the whole it works. Um, and the idea is um, when we're running with our uh, business logic that computes all of the metrics and so on. If there's a bug in the business logic, not so it crashes, but so it makes the incorrect calculations, um, we want to be able to go back in time um, and kind of fix it and redo it. Um, so this is how we do that. Um, so we have some uh, so uh, a concept that we call a checkpoint, um, and uh <coughs> I need to explain a bit more like the background. Um, so we process everything in 24-hour batches. Uh, so a, a metric like revenue per day only makes sense if you have 24 hours worth of data. So that's the window. So our streaming real-time analytics system, um, what it does is really it keeps 24 hours of data in memory, or it keeps one day of data in memory at any, any point. And then once the day is over, you know the revenue for that day and you can write it into the database. So this is the same as if you run a reproduce job like on yesterday's data. Uh, we do the same except on today's data where we don't have all of the data yet. So it's kind of like a partial, we can run it on partial data and it's, um, uh, the state sticks around inside of the reducers, uh, which we then actually use to query um, to get the real-time data. Um, anyway, so this checkpointing system, um, what it means is that um, we have like a, um, the last successful day we processed, that's the last checkpoint. And so when our system starts up, we go, we go and read this checkpoint. And then we um, go into the log and we find all of the data that occurred after this checkpoint. Um, and then we process all of that until the next checkpoint, which would be the next day. So in this example, from the 1st of October midnight to the 2nd of October midnight. Um, and we can actually know when all of that data has been received. Um, since we can go, um, we, we know we have these collector services and we can know where they are in time. So we can actually see um, that now uh, all of the collector services have um, sent all of the data for the previous day. And then it's safe for us to say, we have received everything. Everything is kind of good to go. Um, we can write everything to the database. And then here comes like the big idea. Um, that we also overwrite anything that is already inside of the database. Um, and what this means is that, uh, let's say you, you use MySQL, for example, to store the kind of computed metrics. So you will store revenue per day as just a number inside of MySQL. Um, we, our system is set up in such a way that we don't get duplicate rows. So let's say we mess up at some, at some point during the day, or we mess up when you're writing to the database, so we partially write. Let's say we write 80% of the metrics, for example. Then we need to go back and redo that. Um, and this is a safe to do. We can do it many times. It will always just overwrite anything that is already in there. Um, and then if that is successful, we set the checkpoint to the next uh, window that we just successfully saved. Crystal clear. Um, so what if you want to have a system like this, like where can you get one? Um, so we built our own system to do this, and it's like an Erlang in-memory distributed system, um, um, because there was no alternative when we started. Um, today, there are actually some alternatives, like this Apache Samsa, for example, which does uh, exactly what you want, and a lot more and a lot better. Uh, so you should totally go and have a look at that. Um, I think today, if it was started project over today, Definitely, we would have a hard look at Apache Samsa before we would do anything different. 
so Apache Samsa does uh, uses a Kafka, runs inside of Hadoop Yarn. It does all of this checkpointing, but much nicer, um, has much more fault tolerance and so on than, than we do. Um, so check that out. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we use DynamoDB for uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. How long do you keep data for? Forever. Yeah. It's so so we just pay money to Amazon, so we don't worry so much about that. Our our, our table now with metrics contains over a billion entries, but I still think it, we only pay like a couple of hundred dollars a month for that table, so we don't we don't really care. Thank you. Thank you.